you turn in your Bibles to Second Chronicles. <clears throat> message tonight is uh, the God of all comfort and that's a verse from 2 Corinthians we'll get to it scripture describes the living God as the God of all comfort and to believers he most certainly is and you won't need comfort unless you've been uncomfortable you know you only recognize comfort when you've been uncomfortable or made to be uh, out of position in some way and that's when comfort is so refreshing and so I wanted to get go over a few points tonight at, you know to talk about each and every man knows his own failings his own needs each and every person how far short they are from righteousness that the problems that we have in this life they vex and they afflict us they bring anxiety they bring misery and uh, collectively these things can overwhelm us they can overwhelm us but to take comfort God knows that's trendy saying these days he knows what keeps you up at night and uh, I want to share some of the things about how he comforts his people and and uh, what to do when you're in the midst of, of of a battle the first thing I want to establish is that you know the the, the oft the weaknesses of, of of people of believers the weaknesses of anyone really in 2nd Corinthians excuse me 2nd Chronicles in chapter 6 in a Sol famous prayer of Solomon at the um, <laughs> at the inauguration of the temple if you will and I'll start in verse 22 it's it, Solomon's praying here if, if if any of these things happen God hear the prayer of your saints in verse 22 he says if a man sin against his neighbor and an oath be laid upon him to make him swear and the oath come before thine altar in this house then hear from heaven and do and judge thy servants by re requiting the wicked by recompensing his way upon his own head and by justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. And if thy people Israel be put to the worse before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall return and confess thy name, and pray and make supplication before thee in this house, then hear thou from the heavens, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again into the land which thou gavest to them and to their fathers. When the heaven is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, yet if they pray toward this place, and confess thy name, and turn from their sin when thou dost afflict them. Then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and if, and of thy people Israel when thou hast taught them the good way wherein they should walk and send rain upon thy land which thou hast given unto thy people for an inheritance. If there be a dearth in the land, if there be a pestilence, if there be blasting or mildew, locusts or caterpillars, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people Israel when every one shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hands in this house then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and render unto every man according unto all his ways whose heart thou knowest for thou only knowest the hearts of all the children of men that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways so long as they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers so the point I wanted to pick pick up on here is that where it says every man, every person knows his own sore and his own grief. And it can be all kinds of things. You could be put to the worst before the enemy. You could, it's, when it says it's a dearth in the land, well, you're making money now, what if you're not making money? It could be running uh, uh, things that are provided for you and are not there anymore. It could be sickness. It could be whatsoever sore uh, it says you know, whatever it is that the Lord has in front of you as your affliction these afflictions occur and um, it says uh, when these things occur there, there's a prescription here 
you know, a, a prescription for prayer before the, the God of, of gods and, and confession and supplication. Supplication requ is request. In Proverbs 14.10, this looks long. I got two pages again, but I wanted to leave these verses with you so it's not going to go faster than it looks. In Proverbs 14.10, you see the same thought where it says, the heart knows his own bitterness. Everybody has their own challenges in this life. Your challenges may not be mine, but I'm sure you have challenges. And you can be sure I have challenges. And um, each and every one of us, we know our own sore and our own grief. And we know our own weakness, as was read this morning from Isaiah, when Isaiah saw the Lord God and said, well, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Uh, there's no shortage of failings, needs, and afflictions for the people of God. And in part point two, uh, that these things can bring us a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of misery. And uh, I want to pick off two examples. Uh, one, which turn to uh, to First Samuel. Uh, well, no, let me just tell you. I don't think you need to turn there. The Hannah story. I want to go to the Shunammite woman in a minute. But uh, we read the, partly this morning Hannah's prayer. Uh, the background on the story of Hannah is that uh, she, she was married to a man that had two wives. That's probably a problem in its own right. But uh, the one wife was constantly hectoring her because she didn't have children. And, and she was in uh, great distress about this. And uh, she went before the Lord. And in, in the verse I have laid there before you, and she was in bitterness of soul about this. She was, in, and she prayed unto the Lord, and she wept sore. This was a very difficult thing for her. Okay, and, um, it's, it, and she says, "She vowed a vow, O Lord of Hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction, the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, and will I give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor come upon his head." That's another story for another point. But the point is that she went through this difficult time. Um, the Shunammite woman turned to 2 Kings, one of my favorites in the scripture. She had, um, her and her husband had taken to providing lodging for Elijah. And she perceived this man was a prophet. She understood <laughs> and uh, Elijah told her she was going to have a baby and she did and um, in the process of time the baby dies and that's that's a, an anxiety filled moment right there to have your only child die I can't imagine it I bless the Lord that I can't imagine it I don't want to imagine it, but that's about as high a stress of situation as I can imagine. And um, and you know the story. I'm not going to read it all to you, but in chapter four and, and verse uh, twenty-seven, she she ran, she got on her horse or in her carriage, and she said, "Let's go to the let's go to the preacher." Let's go to the preacher and, and, and type. She's going to the Lord himself. And um, in verse 26, uh, Elijah says to Gehazi, his servant, Run now and pray to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It's well. Now, that's a great statement of faith. And you can think about that one for a long, long time. It's well. Well, it <laughs> doesn't seem to be well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. Gehazi, Gehazi came near to thrust her away, like any servant or bodyguard would. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord has hid it from me and hath not told me. And then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Get gird up thy loins and take my staff in thy hand and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again and lay my staff upon the face of the child. 
And the mother of the child said, and this is also sweet faith speaking, as the, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going until you answer this issue. I have a, a, a broken heart here. And uh, of course, Elisha went to, uh, went to the house and uh, uh, just like with the apostles when they couldn't heal the, the various people and Jesus would ultimately step in and take care of the situation Elijah uh, raised the boy from the dead and uh, the point I want to make though is that you know there are afflictions that come our way things that vex us as this woman her soul was vexed within her uh, and collectively these things can overwhelm us if you can recall in the book of Ruth and I have it listed out there Naomi was another person who had gone through great difficulty uh, she lost her husband and her two sons and all she had left was her daughter-in-law Ruth one the other daughter-in-law took off said well that's that's it for me I'm off to other things and all she had left was uh, Ruth and when she returned to her hometown they said, well, there's Naomi. She said, don't call me Na Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. Because God said, don't very bitter. Which means bitter. Call me bitter. Bitter. This was tough. These are tough things that happen in life. And, you know, there's two kinds of afflictions, really. There's afflictions that God uses to draw his people closer to him. And there's afflictions that God uses to bring unbelievers to to hear the gospel and I, I want to make that separation in point four just before we go any further into you know where to go where to go with this uh, Elihu told Job and this is my favorite one in terms of how God uses these afflictions afflictions occur to everybody but they have their own purposes and their own in, and their own things. They, they, he uses them to bring his people to himself and clo closer and to reveal Christ to them. And for the non-believer, uh, well, it's really sort of the same thing. Elihu told Job, he delivers the poor in his affliction, and here's the point, he opens their ears in oppression. <laughs> I'm reminded of that, uh, that TV commercial. Can you hear me now? He says, the Lord will use affliction to cause you to, to say, you know, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? That's what Elihu was telling Job. He delivers the poor in his affliction. Opens, he opens their ears with this, okay, in oppression. Psalms 119 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I've kept thy word. Affliction has a divine purpose in every life. And you're not going to avoid it. You're not going to sidestep it. Uh, it's there for your benefit and your good. Believers see affliction in a completely different light than the, the world. For the world, it's devastating. It's it's just, it leads them to despair. It leads them to crazy behavior, <laughs> drugs or drinking or whatever it is. They they can't they can't hold up under it. They have no comfort. They have no comfort. They have nowhere to go. The rain's pouring down. And they can't. They have no umbrella. And point five. God knows what keeps you up at night. And and you know number one. He's been there. In Hebrews 2.10, it says, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. He understands suffering. And th thus he's able to, as it says in Scripture, to succor you or to comfort you. Because he's, he's it pleased the Father to make him perfect through suffering. Now, I, I put a question at the top there. I, you know, when I'm on my word processor, I just sort of sometimes free associate. But I thought to myself, if it pleased the Father to make the Son perfect through suffering, what do you think He has in store for you? There's going to be a certain amount of vexation, a certain amount of soreness, a certain amount of grieving, because that's what's needed to to complete you as a believer, and to draw you, to cause you to see more of His Son. In the end. It's to the good. It's to the good. It all works to the good. In Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we don't have a high priest that can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but in all points was tempted like we are, yet without sin. Our captain has sailed through these waters. He knows the way to go. He knows 
and knows the situation you're in, whatever that situation is. And he's well able to meet to meet your need. And you think about in Christ's life, just as an, a couple of examples. I got some uh, verses there. We don't need to turn to them, but uh, in the in the garden, Christ said, "You know, my soul's trouble. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour." But but this is why I'm here. He says he sweat he sweat uh, 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 blood uh, from his own body. That, the, the, the anxiety, the horror of what was going to happen was so intense on his physical body that he literally uh, uh, dropped as it, uh, sweat, as it were, drops of blood. That's, that's an, an anxiety like we don't even understand. But God has a purpose in all of these things. And I, I, I say in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 5 there, I've got it listed out for you. Blessed be the God, uh, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And tonight I just wanted to share with you that whatever your situation and whatever your sore is and whatever your grievance is and whatever is the plague of your heart, whatever that bitterness is, to run to this God of all comfort. You know, that word comfort there is paracleo. Pastor Warner used to talk about that a lot. It means to c console or to encourage to strengthen, and, and the implication was to, to, to come up right alongside you and walk with you. Our God walks through the fire with his people. He's been there. He's done that. He, you're there because he, it's for your good and your best interest. Very difficult to see in the middle of it. It's very easy to be like uh, Naomi and say, I'm just bitter about it. Life's too tough. It's too much. <laughs> But you know, even for Naomi, life ended up good. And Job, God had, God takes the people through. They see what they need to see, and God, uh, He deals with them, shows them more of Christ. And let's continue on in Second Corinthians. Says the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that that we may be able be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds by Christ. These things that we go through, whatever they are, that consolation of God, that comfort that he gives us, abounds. We know it, we understand it, we revel in it, we thank God for it. <clears throat> so uh, the conclusion then kind of addresses two things. You know, one is those who, who know not this Christ, uh, it may be that affliction can drive you to understand your need. Um, it's it's the unique quality of God to comfort the downcast. He hears the cry of the humble. Uh, like Job said, you know, I heard thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. And I, I pour myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Um, it's the unique character of our God that he comforts those that are cast down. And I was thinking this morning about how he comforts those that are cast down, that thief on the cross cast down as he was saying saying uh, we deserve what we get we deserve what we get but Lord remember me when you come in your kingdom cast down in this way his life ebbing away seeing the hopelessness of his state but, but God's justice in, his, in it all and he simply said Lord remember me uh, the man this morning when I, I read in the morning scripture the, the person who said I'm not going to take the upper seat I can't do that. I have no right to take the upper seat in this at this wedding. And God says, "Come and, and promotes him as it was." Uh, there is there is a humbling, and to those that are cast down by affliction, uh, I encourage you to this God who comforts those who are cast down. I commend you to Him. Um, he hears the high cry of the humble. <laughs> to those who follow this Christ, I encourage you in affliction stay before your God. You know, follow the Shunammite's example or Hannah's example. She was, I'm not going to, I'm not going anywhere until, you know, Lord, you bring this to a res resolution in my life. In, in, in the Shunammite's case, it was the, the, her child had died. She wasn't going to let go of uh, Elisha. She wasn't, in picture, she wasn't letting go of Christ until she was comforted about whatever it was that was going on. And it says in, uh, in Philippians, and I've, Memorize this verse over the years, and it's a good one to remember for cert for certain. 
in Philippians 4 and 6 and 7, it says, be careful or anxious for nothing. And we're so prone to anxiety, so prone to worrying about this thing or that thing, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen a week from now, uh, what's this test result, what's that thing. You know, we, we, we have a thousand things to be anxious about. And if, if it's really 10,000, a thousand about all that we can comprehend. But in everything by prayer and supplication, let your, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And in those requests and in, the, in those prayers and in that thanksgiving, it says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. I've always been encouraged, it says, that your hearts and your minds, because there's an emotional component of a person and there's a thinking component of a person. And it says in this in this prayer and in this supplication letting your request be made known to now there are people who say well why would anybody who believes that God is sovereign pray God already knows he asks you to his word says let your request be made known believers obey this is what he wants he, he, he God takes pleasure in those prayers I don't expect that my prayer is going to change things, but it'll change me. God has in mind what's been from the beginning of the world, what's going to occur, but he's going to change me. And uh, for that, I thank him. And it's uh, certainly, it's, you know, this peace of God, which passes all understanding. The world can't understand it. That's why they, they sink under these difficulties. Uh, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In affliction, look to Christ and his instruction about your... Uh, uh, your tribulation. Jesus said, you know, it's uh, in the world you're going to have to, uh, tribulation. He goes, these things I spoke unto you that you might have peace. In the world you shall, not might, might, maybe, you <laughs> shall have tribulation. There will be these things come your direction. He says, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Our captain is in front of us. He's in front of our situation. We, he's walking by our, the Spirit of God walks by our side. He's the God of all comfort. Um, so I would encourage you to make your plans, fight your battle. May God enlarge you to faithfully look to Christ for victory, for the outcome, for your comfort and consolation, for good cheer, for peace. And once you're consoled and being consoled, you're going to be a different person. You're going to, able to, you're going to be able to help those in need that are around you or going through other battles. You go through battles that you might be, as it says up there in the, Second Corinthians, um, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble with the comfort that we were comforted with when we sailed through those seas. And so, kind of in, in conclusion here, don't think it a strange thing that <clears throat> difficulties come your way in life things that vex you, things that, uh, as it says, uh, each man knows his own plague, the plague of his own heart, his own sore, the things that uh, grieve, grieve him about the world we live in, about, about situations that we're in, whether it's bitterness of soul or vexation or whatever you want to call it. Um, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he, he, we, he tells us to come boldly before the throne of grace in our time of need. We have this access that the world doesn't have. And that access is to the God of all comfort. And I encourage you to that. Uh, it's a remarkable thing. Uh, that comfort was was, a, uh, was accomplished on the cross when he, Christ did all that was necessary to save wretches like you and I. And may it be that you find comfort there in your time of need, whatever that, whatever that need might be, whether you know him not or whether it's a life circumstance. Like the scripture says, it could be a thousand things, whatever it is, he's there.